Hello, I'm Joshua Das, um, Head of Department at the Department of Radiation Oncology in St. Charles Gardner Hospital and I'll be giving a talk today on the molecular biology of cancers. So essentially, let's kick off. Having known that you have some background that you've done really biology, we really want to now know of the mechanisms which make a cancer become a cancer. So there are many steps and I'm going to take you through all of these as we go along. So if we look at my simple plan of attack is that we'll start at the top where we can see what is a cancer, a simple approach. How does a cancer develop? The steps to cancer development, molecular changes that cause cancer, and this is where much of the work will be, and then the significance of this and how we can apply it to the future. So let's start off. What is a cancer? Well, the first thing to start with is to say the definition and then proceed on to the ins and outs of what a cancer is to become a cancer. So, a simple definition. We can read all the different types of definitions, but essentially to me, a cancer is a cell that has gone out of control, that it will eat away at the expense of its environment. So if we go through this, cancerous cells are those that divide repeatedly, out of control, and there is no way of stopping them. They will infiltrate and destroy the surrounding tissues. Okay. And then the second part of cancers is that they have an ability to become independent of their local area and spread so they can metastasize. And that then leads to secondary areas of tumors. So this is a simple definition to me that cancer is essentially a group of cells that have no inhibition in stopping growing and they will continue to grow at the expense of their host environment. Let's now look into the mechanism of cancer growth. When I cut myself, I'll find that there will be a whole heap of cells coming to the healing process and they will accumulate and they will repair and then they will dissipate. Imagine a scenario now where cells accumulate and accumulate and accumulate to the expense of the surrounding tissue. So there has to be something that stops at the right time such that the, once the job is done, the accumulation stops and then everything dissipates. In each cell, there is a given mechanism where a cell can divide, but it does not endlessly divide because there are checkpoints in the cell cycle that have the ability to stop further cell division. These checkpoints are located at three particular locations on the cell cycle. So if we look at this diagram, we can just, as you will all remember, what the cell cycle is, is that we have a mitotic phase, which is the red area with an M at the top, and we have the black area called the interphase. And then there's a period where the cell is not cycling, which is where it's in a resting phase called the geophase. So when you look at this, a cell will be in a resting phase, something will make it come into the cell cycle and then it will start going through these phases at G1, the S phase, G2 and then into the mitotic phase where the cell divides. But 
if we did not have somewhere along this cell cycle a place where we can suddenly halt the process, all we'll have is an endless growth of cells. There are three checkpoints we mentioned. And the first checkpoint you can see is down here, G1. The second checkpoint is G2. And there is another checkpoint at the anaphase area of the mitotic region. And these checkpoints require certain external factors to influence them and stop the progression into cell division. If these checkpoints go out of control, then we could be in a perpetual cell division. And so, when we look at this, this fundamental understanding of the cell cycle is essential because if you think about it, if I could cause a block here or here or here, I could actually stop a cancer cell growth. Because if you think about it, the cancer cell is in a perpetual mitotic phase. It is endlessly di dividing. If I had a way of blocking at these checkpoints, hence the medical term checkpoint inhibitors, which is how we use in clinical practice today. So, as we mentioned, that there were three checkpoints and proteins within the cell control the cell cycle. These proteins are very important at blocking these checkpoints to stop cell progression. And the two that are very important are what we call cyclins and kinases. And at some point in future lectures we will go into this a lot more detail, but for an essential overview, this is what we're looking at. The next question I have to ask myself is what on earth makes a cell go out of control? So there must be something that disrupts the cell that it goes into a perpetual division. And these things or substances that can make a cell go into a perpetual division and cause a cancer are called carcinogens. And I put four as a starter. Number one, ionizing radiation, X-rays. Number two, chemicals. And I'll give you an example, tar. Number three, infective viruses and hereditary predisposition. But let's go into a little bit more detail. Occupational and environmental factors. We all have heard of asbestos, found in the roofing. And I won't comment anymore, but we found it in our new children's hospital roof as well. But moving on, this causes lung cancers, nickel, chromate, benzene, arsenic, radioactive substances, cool tires, herbicides and pesticides. You can see there is an endless list of things that can promote. And when you look at the overall understanding of things that will cause a change in the cell uh, reproduction rate, smoking and alcohol makes up 30% of associations with cancer. Sadly, unrecognized is an unbalanced diet. So maybe we are what we eat and we should be very careful what we eat because high glycemic carbohydrates, obesity, lack of physical activity may be all a part and parcel of our modern cancer life. Hormonal changes, chronic infections, hepatitis B and more recently HPV, which is the human papillovirus and is associated, as you know, with cervical cancers and head and neck cancers, 
leading to now the requirement, at least in Australia, that all children must be vaccinated against HPV. So now we know that some of these factors can cause a cancer or initiate a cancer effect. The ones that cause a cancer are called carcinogens, whereas a mutagen is just something that causes a mutation in the genetic material. So all carcinogens are mutants or mutagens. And so moving on from there, this carcinogen will cause a gene mutation. And you may require two or three gene mutations before there is a change in the structure of the DNA at an area called the oncogene, which then produces proteins that cause uncontrolled growth of a cancer cell. Another issue that can happen at an oncogene is that it produces a protein that prevents the cancer cell from dying, so it becomes immortal. When a cancer becomes immortal, that means it's lost its ability to self-destruct. That ability to self-destruct is called apoptosis. And when you lose your ability to self-destruct, you become immortal and grow endlessly. So we know that cancer cells have an ability to stop this me mechanism of apoptosis. Right, so going on into a little bit more detail then, is that how do normal cells become cancerous? The target is in the cancer cell, the chromosomes. It is here that the chromosomes have a mutation and this mutation will go on to other mutations and eventually there will be a mutation that brings about a malignant cell. If you look at this simple picture, we could have initially metaplasia, then we have dysplasia, and then we have carcinoma in situ, and then we have an invasive cancer. These are the sort of steps that can happen, and they are all genetically related. So the steps of cancer development are, if you're looking at the cell, is that there is a darkening or a more blue. That's why it's called basophilia. The number and size of the nuclei increase. Increased nuclear cytoplasmic ratio. What does that mean? That really means that the amount of chromosome material starts to become more than what is in the cytoplasm. And then they start to stick together, the cells, and they are called cluster or cord formation. That's the cytological changes. What about growth characteristics? The cells become immortal. They don't die, they just carry on growing. They have a loss of what is known as contact inhibition. When you have a crowd of cells stuck together, they interact with each other to make sure that they don't have any more cells because there is only a limited blood supply. If that contact with other cells is lost, then they start to endlessly grow. And that is what contact inhibition is, that they actually start to just independently grow at the expense of everything around them. Anchorage independence. These cells can break away because they've lost their anchor, so to speak. Hence, metastasize. The cell cycle, loss of control. We talked about those checkpoint in areas are now no longer inhibited. 
and then self-destruction resistance. So they continue to live endlessly. So this term, apoptosis, now we go into a little bit more detail about what's happening. And there is a protein called P53. And it is a critical protein because aberrations in this protein can result in many cancers. In fact, if you have a genetic disruption of this P53 protein, which is produced on chromosome 17, then you have a condition called Lee-Fraumeni syndrome. And Lee-Fraumeni syndrome is where the, there is unfortunately a aberration at the P53 level. The problem is that when this happens you can have cancer growth in the brain, in the lungs, any part of the body because all cells have now lost their ability uh, to stop growing and live forever. So apoptosis is strongly associated with P53 and also with BCL2. These are the two suppressor gene products, so to speak. And at a later stage, when we go um, in perhaps another lecture, we'll be talking about suppression and activation. A P53 protein can be activated by becoming phosphorylated, so that it causes a self-destruction. But if you don't have that, then the cell lives forever. So this is just an introduction to the conditions. Moving on, there are other steps to cancer development, including cell membrane structural changes, cell interaction changes, differentiation of response, loss, and altered signal transduction mechanisms. Let me explain this in a little bit more detail. The first point to get into a cell is the cell membrane. If I can in some way touch the cell membrane so it becomes activated, it causes an internal activation to get the cell reproducing rapidly. If I have a functional loss of my cell membrane that I allow growth factors to penetrate more than they should, then I can cause a sudden excess growth of cells. Number two, if I have a problem in the cytoplasm and its interactions with the other cells, like contact inhibition, then again I can develop into a cancer. Differentiation response loss. What does that mean? Well, differentiation is where one cell produces another cell that looks like the original cell. That would mean that they are differentiated because they look like the parent. When they start to look completely ugly and irregular, that's when we call them undifferentiated or bizarre cells, and these are cancer cells. So when we lose the differentiation ability, then we have a problem that we have now cancer production, because they are no longer looking like the parent cell. Moving on, then the last point is the altered signal transduction mechanism. Big long word, but simply there is a signal that causes a transduction in the cell, to cause a function to occur. If this is altered such that the signal continues to fire for cell growth, then you will have endless cell growth. And this is what we mean by altered signal transduction. So the significance of all of these changes <coughs> can result in an oncogene protein causing increased expression 
of the DNA. So that it keeps on growing, for instance. Alternatively, we could have a loss of tumor suppression gene protein. In other words, we can't stop the expression. One, we overexpress. Second, we try to suppress expression. And if that's lost, it will comp continue to overexpress. And then we know that DNA methylation patterns change are associated with this increased expression. Growth substance overproduction can cause excess growth and unregulated growth factors. These are all related, so let's bring it in a little bit more in detail. If we look at the hallmarks of cancer, I've taken this from Anahan and Weinberg's cell, which show all the different things that can happen. And I think this is a picture that is a good one to almost come to a close with, which gives us an idea of all the different mechanisms in a cell that could go badly wrong. First of all, let's start somewhere at the, perhaps let's start here, the telomerase inhibitors. We know that every cell in the body has got a certain life expectancy. And therefore, when they come to the end of their life, they will apoptose, they will self-destruct. This life expectancy is given by a genetic code controlled by telomerase. And if these telomerase or telomerase inhibitors are disrupted, then the cell will not wind down to a death, but will continue to grow endlessly and exist endlessly. So, they have this ability to enable replicative immortality. So there's one mechanism. And you'll notice the infinity sign, meaning forever. I won't go through all the other signs, but you'll make it up as you go along. Anti-inflammatory drugs. So if you have an anti-inflammatory drug, then that will, if that is disrupted, then the tumor will continue to produce inflammation. What is inflammation? It is the gathering of all these different cells such as mast cells and all the macrophages coming together. So this is a tumor promoting inflammation if the anti-inflammatory drugs um, are ineffective. And of course, by using selective anti-inflammatory, we can actually stop the inflammation. Activating invasion and metastases using inhibitors of HGF. And if I keep going through all of these, the most important ones that are currently becoming a major player are these two at the top. EGFR inhibitors and cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitors. And these, this one works at the um, cell cycle checkpoints and these work at the cell membrane surface. As for today, I'm just merely introducing these concepts so that you understand that there are so many areas avoiding immune uh, disruption, evading growth suppressors, sustaining proliferative signals. You'll see that the whole aim here is to make sure the cancer cell lives forever. And if there is a way of blocking at this level, then we can actually um, kill the cancer. Now I'm going to go into a little bit of what's happening today around the world and to apply some of this. Melanoma used to be a death killer once it had spread. It was an incurable disease. 
And then more recently, in the last few years, we found that some of the melanomas showed a irregularity at this level, what is called the BRAF. And it became obvious that if you could use drugs to block the BRAF expression, then we could actually kill the cancer cells. And today, those that exhibit the BRAF expression can literally be completely controlled with drugs such as venerophonib. There's others like dibrofenib and so on that have the same action that block at this level. And this is currently what's happening. So, where is this happening? This is happening in the cytoplasm of the cell. Here is the nucleus. We're in the cytoplasm and it affects these pathways, which on another occasion we will go in a little bit more detail because these are major pathways. Another way is what is known as the programmed um, death, uh, L1. And if you can figure out how to block these, the PD-1 inhibitors, then you can actually um, have another effective way of causing tumor cell death. And one of the um, most effective drugs today that is being used is some, a drug called um, pembrolizumab. And that is used in um, uh, melanomas and many other cancers today. The reason why I'm just touching base because you're starting to see that there are so many drugs. And the Refinib I mentioned, the Refinib, these two are very important. And you start to get an idea of all the interactions that we're starting to see among cancers and where they target. But still, there is at least one third of cancer cells or cancers that we have no idea what the driver is. But this is where all the research is now going. It's finding out what makes a cancer start expressing endlessly and grow. Because if we can do that, then we can block that pathway and then stop the cancer growth. And you can see all of these are just a tip of the iceberg. So, to the future, there is, to me, the key point is everything is about patience. And if we ever lose sight of what we're doing, that this is all for the benefit of the patients, we really should not be here. And everything we do, whether it's the clinicians, the industry, the academic researchers or the regulatory bodies, is a protection of the patients. And everything we want to do is to make sure that we can maintain a quality of life and we ethically do not take away their autonomy nor do we do them harm by whatever drugs we're doing. And th these principles of ethics should be applied in all cases of what we're involved with. And to me, these are the four stakeholders, if you look at them, the clinicians, the industry, the academic researchers and regulators. And as you come out, you'll see that there are multidisciplinary you know, effects of academics, and likewise, clinicians have multidisciplinary meetings to make sure whatever we're doing is as a group collaborative rather than an individual uh, personal approach. And I think this is where the challenges are. And whichever part you're involved with, I think all of us can work together to make sure that the patients are the winners. So at this stage I'm coming to the end of my discourse, but if I could just say that when we started with the new ball game of genetic approach to management of cancers, you see in 1891 was when the first vaccine demonstrated an effect against cancers and today, in 2000, we have approved 
such as the epidemic of bad proof of metastatic melanoma. This is where we've got to. And I think the game is afoot now to make sure that we are on track to winning against cancer. Uh, coming now to the end of my discussion, and uh, I'll be grateful if you would forward questions to myself, but I hope this has been a simplistic approach to molecular biology in the management of cancers. Thank you.